Thank you, Brother Walt Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Justin, Ruth and I are delighted to be with you here at uh, Albany uh, for our worship service today. And we hope that uh, all of us will be profited and held spiritually by these songs and uh, remembering uh, the Lord's Supper. I want to tell you a story. I don't think I've told you this before. I kind of think about it when we take communion. By the way, I was told to do something here. There. <laughs> I have to have a red light on. Anyway, I was, I was um, just a teenager, and a friend of mine over in Virginia, in Arlington, we, uh, he was a neighbor of mine. We played ball together and went to school together. He was, I think, a year younger than I. But we were good friends, and his family went to an Episcopalian church called St. George's Episcopal. It's on Fairfax Drive over in you know, North Arlington. And uh, the first time that I accepted the invitation to go with that family, I sat in a pew near the back with my buddy, and um, I heard when they passed, it was the Sunday that they took communion, and as they passed the emblems, I heard some mumbling up front. I didn't know what that was all about because I wasn't familiar with their way of doing things. And anyway, as it got closer and closer, uh, the lady to my right, whom I didn't know, on the pew, same pew as I was sitting, uh, she took communion, and then she passed it to me, and she said this as she passed the bread. She said, the body of Christ. And I you know, took it, and I took the piece, and passed it along. I didn't know if I should say anything since I was a visitor. But that's what they were saying. <clears throat> and then a few minutes later, when the fruit of the vine was passed, you guessed it. She passed it to me and she said, the blood of Christ. I like that. I don't think it's something that you need to incorporate. I'm not suggesting that. But I like that. Because it helps us to know, you know, this is not just a cracker. It's not just grape juice. It's much more significant than that. Anyway, I hope that we have all been profit of, I'm sure we have, through our community together today. Thank you, Jeff, for your fine song reading. Um, let's turn to 1 Peter, the third chapter. 1 Peter, chapter 3. <coughs> chapter of 1 Peter. Let me begin reading at verse 18. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. For Christ died for the ungodly. Once for all for the sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. The light figure under which even baptism also now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. In the Word of God, both Old Testament and New Testaments, there are many types and anti-types. Let me explain that rather unusual word. What that means is that these two things are correlative one to the other. They are uh, things that bear a likeness one to another. 
they bear a resemblance. Let me give you a rather easy example to understand. In the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers, you have the story of um, the Jewish people uh, disobeying God, being very bad and sinful in their uh, lives, and God was fed up with them, and so many of the people were bitten by poisonous snakes that God placed in that, in that area. And finally, when they repented, and God told Moses to erect a brazen or brass serpent on a pole and tell the Jewish people that whoever would come before that and look upon it, they would be healed. And sure enough, that's what happened. Not all of them did that, and many people of Israel died. But the point is that when they came before that brass serpent and with faith looked upon it, they were healed. Now, in the New Testament, all of us are familiar with John 3.16. That's the most uh, familiar passage in all the Bible, I guess, for most people. But two verses before, in verse 14, <coughs> the Bible says this, As Moses commanded to look upon the serpent in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up. You see, there's a correspondence between the brass serpent being lifted up on a pole, and when those people looked upon him in that circumstance, they were saved from their poisonous snake bites, and then Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And those who will look upon Jesus and accept him as the crucified Savior, they also will be saved from their poisonous bites, as it were, from Satan himself. Now, obviously, the occurrence of these types and antitypes are for the purpose of clarity in teaching. By understanding the type and its function, we can more easily understand the antitype. But a word of caution must be given. We must not draw unscriptural, unbiblical conclusions. When we deal with parables and prophecies, and with these types and antitypes, we have to be careful not to say uh, or understand they say more than they really say. For example, I heard a man years ago who was preaching, uh, he uh, quoted uh, Matthew 13 and verse 33 where Jesus simply says that a woman took some dough and put it in three measures of meal. And he was talking about the influence and the power of the Christian message. This man said that the three, me three measures mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I looked back at the Bible, you know, I thought, where on earth is he getting that? You see, I think we can make things say something that the Bible doesn't say. So we have to be careful about that. But when the Bible definitely and definitively identifies the type with the antitype, then we can proceed with great uh, confidence to learn the intended lesson. And just such a case of positive identification comes in the text that I read to you from 1 Peter, the third chapter. You and I can understand that just as in Noah's case, so also in your case and mine, there are things we need to look for in terms of how God brings us to a state of being not uh, condemned sinners but saved followers of his. The words like figure in the text are coming from a Greek word, if I can pronounce it correctly, on titupon, which if you transliterate, by that I mean if you take each Greek letter and replace it with the corresponding English letter, you get the word that we just mentioned, antitype. And so you and I can understand that the light figure here, which refers to baptism, is an antitype of the water in Noah's case. So let's ask ourselves about Noah's case. And if you have a Bible, it would be helpful if you would turn with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 6. Let me give you just a moment to turn to that. And we want to examine the case of Noah and gain more insight into the resemblances of that case of people being saved and today 
how people are saved under the uh, matter of Jesus Christ being our Lord and Savior. In the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, let me read several verses. First of all, verse 3 says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. I drop down to verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of his thoughts, uh, of the thoughts of his heart, was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But, and notice, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Some of your translations say favor, but it's the Hebrew word that is corresponding to the New Testament word grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? That Noah found grace. What does grace mean to you? Well, it means unmerited favor. Okay, let me ask another question. What does unmerited favor mean to you? I hope we understand that it means that you and I do not deserve God's kindness, God's love, God's salvation. You and I are blessed with His grace is unmerited favor. You and I cannot do, uh, earn it. We can't pay for it. In Noah's day, the world was exceedingly wicked, as we just read here in Genesis 6, in verse uh, 5. Man not only did not deserve grace, he deserved the exact opposite. He deserved eternal uh, damnation. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Well, verse 9 tells you and me, as we read, that Noah was just. That word means he was uh, right. He gave all their due. He tried to be fair in his dealings. He was perfect in his generation. One scholar says that phrase means consistent in his character and never departing from the principle of of truth. He tried to be fair in dealing with other people. And then thirdly and most importantly, Noah walked with God. He had a fixed purpose about his life. Namely, he determined to live for God. Now, is everybody sitting down except for Tim? Tim, be careful. <laughs> Back there. Everybody hold on. I want to ask you a rather embarrassing question. <clears throat> Difficult question. How do I how do you, and you supply your name, how do you, how do we compare with old man Noah? Contemplate that for a moment. How do we compare with Noah? You see, you and I need to understand that Noah did not, and don't get the wrong idea, he didn't deserve God's grace, or else it wouldn't be grace. But he differed from other men in that he determined and decided to live for God. Yes, he made mistakes. He stumbled. He uh, sinned. He lost patience. The Bible even says over back in the book of Genesis here, in chapter 6, further down, that he got drunk. Drank too much wine and got drunk. Shame on him. But he had stick to it to this. He came back to God in penitence over and over again. And he wanted to be God's person and not be a selfish sinner. He had stick to it in this perseverance. And because of it, Noah was saved by grace. Now the question is, is there a similarity in our own conversion process? Are we saved by grace? I remember uh, hearing a story about one of my favorite preachers whom I never met. He died before uh, I ever got a chance to meet him or hear him preach. G.C. Brewer was his name. I used to know a man years ago from Texas who was an elder in a church where Brother Brewer was a preacher for a while. And it was a, a 
delight to hear uh, the stories about this great man of God. And some of you have been around in the church a long time, know the name G.C. Brewer. He was a great preacher. He had a discussion with a woman one time who was a Baptist. And in that discussion, she said to Brother Brewer, you folks in the Church of Christ don't believe we're saved by grace. And Brother Brewer's answer was, oh, madam, yes, we do believe that we are saved by grace. Sometimes in our emphasis, our emphasis on faith, or our emphasis upon repentance, or our emphasis upon the need to confess Christ, our emphasis especially on the need for baptism, or the forgiveness of our sins, we can give people the wrong idea that we think we're saved through those actions rather than by grace. And that's the kind of idea this lady had. Brother Brewer tried to uh, get her uh, understanding uh, in a correct mode. Well, it's not important what Brother Brewer says or what Mike Anglin says. What's important is what does the Bible say? And let me turn to the New Testament this time, to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, and you and I have a wonderful passage in the second chapter, and beginning at verse 8. For it is by grace, and let me get a little technical here, the, the Greek word here is a native of means, and really it can be correctly translated by means of grace. So let me translate it that way. Verse 8, for it is by means of grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You and I, you see, are blessed with the fact that we are saved by means of God's grace. And look at the first couple of verses in this same chapter. Uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 1. As for you, the people to whom Paul is writing, as for you, you were, before they became Christians, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature, objects of wrath. How's that set with you? You see, that describes you and me before we knew Christ. Before we had any desire to live godly lives. We were all sinful men. No wonder we need to be saved by God's grace. So you and I have the blessing of understanding that we're saved by undeserved merit on God's part not our part. Jesus said one time in John 8 and 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. The passage you see makes the divine Christ the object of our faith. Faith always has to have an object. Faith means trust and dependence, but you have to have an object in which you trust, upon which you depend and rely. Well, that object is the divine Son of God who died for you and me on the cross and then was raised the third day. Faith, then, is uh, the uh, standard by which we come and receive God's grace, which brings us to the second element in salvation of Noah. Let me turn with you, uh, please, to Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says there in verse 7, Hebrews 11 and verse 7, by faith, Noah, when he was warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Not once, not twice, but three times the word faith is mentioned there. Now, I don't know, I'm going to give you my opinion. The Bible doesn't say this, so watch out. But I think what is meant here when it says that by faith Noah when warned about things not yet seen, I think he means rain. I don't know that the Bible ever says it rained before this particular time. 
But uh, that may not be correct, so be careful. But whatever it is, you see, Noah needed to have trust and faith in God's message to him about what was about to happen. Floodgates, as it were, were going to open. Great rain for 40 days and 40 nights was about to fall. Never been seen before. And so, you see, Noah was to have faith. And as Noah has faith, you see, we also need to understand that faith is a part of our own salvation process. I want to ask you this question. What would have happened if Noah had not had faith? I think the following things would be true. He would not have become an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith, as we read in the Bible. Number two, he would not have built an ark, which led to the saving of his family. Number three, he would not have walked with God and thereby would have received no grace. And number four, he would have been destroyed with the rest of mankind. That's how important faith was in Noah's case, salvation process. So again, I want to ask, how important does faith have an antitype in our own salvation? The verse just before the one we just read, in Hebrews 11, which would be verse 6, says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, but he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently, you see, praise him and follow him and obey him. So you and I are to have great faith and trust in God, just like Noah. In in this uh, verse we read a moment ago, in Ephesians 2, the Bible says not only that we're saved by grace, but it's, it goes on to say, through faith. Faith is that which received, uh, receives the, the free gift of God. If I say uh, to Stu, uh, Stu, I'd like to give you this pen. Now watch what he's going to do. No, he's not going to do anything. See, he, he's not going to take it. He has to in some way reach up and take it. You can't have it. No. <laughs> Just teasing. Just an illustration. <laughs> uh, but you see, we have when someone offers us a gift, in some way we have to show that we're going to receive it. Well, the same thing is true about the gift of God, of, of God's grace. When God offers us the, the gift of grace and uh, the uh, potential salvation through that, we have to receive it. And the way we receive it is through our faith. For by means of grace are you saved, here it comes, through faith, you see. Well, so faith is very important in our salvation process also. If we have no faith, we cannot receive the gift of God's grace. It will be impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6, we just read it. And thirdly, we will die in our sins. For Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins, as we read a moment ago. Faith is crucially important. A third element in Noah's salvation process was obedience. Looking again at Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Notice it again. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, that means reverence, respect, standing in awe of God. It's what fear means in the New Testament word. In holy fear, built an ark to the saving of his family. You see, if, you see, Noah not only just believed and had faith, but he let that faith express itself in terms of obeying what God told him to do. Now, you and I can read back way back in Genesis 6 here. You and I can read the commandments that God gave him. Look at it. Look at Genesis 6, if you have that still open. And verse 13, God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So, here it comes. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. So the older versions say uh, a different kind of wood, but cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish it. 
uh, or pardon me, and finish the arc to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the arc and make lower, middle, and upper decks. Now, did Noah do that? Well, the Bible says in Genesis 6 and verse 22, Thus did Noah most... I thought somebody would get up and walk out. I didn't know what the Bible says at all. I intentionally misquoted it. Thus did Noah almost all... That isn't what it says either. Get it right, angler, or go home. <laughs> Here's what it says. Thus did Noah all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah did not quibble with God. Noah did not argue with God. Noah did not try to in, in, inject his own ideas of how to build an ark. What if he built the ark 500 feet long instead of 450? Would that have been all right? I don't think so. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. Now, because of his obedience, he prepared an ark, quote, to the saving of his family. Obedience was extremely important, you see. Now, the question again comes, does obedience have an antitype, a twin, in our own salvation process? Jesus said in John 12 and verse 42 that unless we believe that... Uh, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. We need to have faith, or else we're going to have to face spiritual annihilation. James, the second chapter, in verse 14, says that faith without works is dead. Can a man say he has, uh, say he has faith and, and not obey? Of course, the answer is no. What, what kind of faith is that, James asked? It's not faith at all. It's only pretense. In Hebrews 5, Verses 8 and 9, the Bible says of Jesus, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation, listen, of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Obedience is critical, you see, in our own salvation process. Oh, let me say quickly before we misunderstand something, our acts of obedience are not meritorious any more than were Noah's. But they are expressions of faith, as I said just a moment ago. Hebrews 11 and 7 begins with faith and it ends with faith, that same verse. And all the acts of obedience of Noah's part or your part or mine do not cancel the fact that we are saved by grace through faith, not for any merit on our part. So our acts of obedience are not meritorious. They are rather, as I've said before twice now already, let me say it again, they are an evidence, a demonstration, an expression of our faith in God. But fourthly and finally, there is a specific element of likeness between Noah's salvation process and ours, and that is the water. In 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, let me read that again. First Peter 3. And I'm going to read verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, Who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. The light figure, the antitype, the light figure, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I are blessed, you see, to know that we can be assured and comforted and have confidence that we can, through obeying God, receive His blessing of salvation. Now, the Bible says here that in Noah's case, you see, he constructed the ark 
The water came, the water buoyed the ark up, it separated those who were saved in the ark, eight people, from those on the earth who perished. You and I can understand that in the water of Noah's day, in that flood water was destroyed symbolically the evils of sin of the earth, and Noah and his family emerged into a new existence. And note, if you will, with me please, what the Bible says in terms of baptism in our case. It is the final culminating act whereby we receive salvation and escape damnation. Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus himself, our Lord, said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Why didn't he say, he that disbelieveth and is not baptized? Because if you don't believe, you're not ready for baptism. You see, baptism expresses, I've already said, expresses our faith, our belief in Jesus as our personal Savior on the cross and the risen Lord. So you and I have a blessing to know that we can also escape. What did the water do in Noah's case? It bore up the ark. It separated those who were lost from those who were saved, as I said before. And in the water, symbolically, was destroyed the sin and the evils on the earth. Now, in our own case, baptism, you see, also is that dividing line. You and I are told, as many as were baptized into Christ, put on Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27. So in the water of baptism is where the old man of sin is buried. It's where we emerge to walk in newness of life. Romans 6 and verse 4 tells you and, you and me that in very clear language. Again, Romans 6 and verse 4. So my friends, listen to me as sincerely as I try to speak this. This passage that we've been reading says Noah was and his family that they were saved by water and then it alludes to baptism here in first peter 3 verses 18 following it alludes to baptism the conclusion is this our salvation occurs at baptism or through water now let me hasten to say we're not teaching water salvation there is no magic potion in that baptistry back there or in my, my aunt's bathtub where I baptized her when she was nearly 100 years old over in Arlington uh, some months ago now. And there's no magic potion uh, in the Potomac River where I baptized people years and years ago. But the magic, you see, it's not magic. The power for cleansing is in the blood of Christ. Baptism is an expression of our faith in Jesus. And so we're not teaching that uh, there's some kind of magic formula in the act of baptism. But it is an expression of our acceptance of Jesus as the crucified and resurrected Son of God. That's why baptism is an immersion. It's not a sprinkling. Years ago as a child, I was sprinkled, so I was told. I don't remember anything about it. Somebody was holding me as a baby. Some preacher... You know, who reads the Bible differently than I do, he sprinkled water on me and they called it baptism. I was later told that. And then I began to read the Bible. And I began to study it carefully. And I read that the word, the Greek word baptizo means, hear this, to dip beneath, to immerse, to baptize. Why is that so important? Because it symbolizes my faith and your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important. So let's get it right as the Bible teaches it. In this sense, you see, baptism doth also now save us. So my good friends, I want to ask you today, in what condition, in what condition is your heart and soul? Are you aware of God's amazing grace that he's offering you a gift that nobody deserves, but it's a gift that will cleanse you and make you ready for the gates of heaven someday when you're through with life here. 
Do you believe in Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of your personal soul? Is your faith willing to submit and obey as was Noah's, the commands of Almighty God? And if so, then I ask you finally, have you come to the water? Have you been immersed or baptized for the remission of your sins, as the Bible says in Acts 2 and verse 38? If not, don't put it off any longer. But obey the will of God. And if you are here today and are a Christian, but you need special prayers for strengthening your faith and for forgiveness of the mistakes you've made, and you'd like to share that with us, we're ready to help you do that. So come now, in whatever state you are, while we stand together and sing. There's a fountain.